Let's quickly think of what we were looking at last week. Recap that, and then our focus this week, and for most of us, is going to be finding settings for the PID control. So let's take a look at what we mean by that again. Uh, we spent most of the past week looking at the PID controller, and we looked at it in the context of this uh, block diagram that we've now become very comfortable with. We've got our set point at the end, and we're comparing that to our control variable that we're feeding back around here, and subtracting that. So our set point really tells the system where we'd like to be. And set points typically remain fixed, but periodically the company might change the set point up, change the set point down, and then they wish the control system to achieve that set point. So that's that signal coming in from the operator. The operator is sitting at the control desk, keying in the set point value. The error gets calculated, and that's what gets fed into our controller. This is, this is the part of our program, GC. That controller, which exists in some computer software somewhere in the company, will then calculate an output which we call the manipulated variable. And the manipulated variable gets sent to the process. So the process GP of S receives that manipulated variable signal. And from that, I'll come to that block in a minute, we get our control variable CD, which is what we do now. Now, part of what we did last week was we also looked at the fact that that control variable is not just made up out, out of the output from the process, there's also another component to it, the disturbance. So, typically the disturbance is added above the process, but there's no reason why you can't add it down here. Let's put our disturbance here in 2D of S. And that disturbance comes in and we add these two together. So there's my disturbance, and it's this signal that we joins some of the disturbance plus the manipulated variable effect of the process. Both of these get combined and added up to form the control curve. So the typical example of the disturbance we looked at last week was if you said, let's consider the temperature in this room, the temperature then is CV, the temperature in this room is affected by many things, but two things that it might be influenced by is some disturbance. In this particular room, the disturbance to the temperature could be the amount of heat lost out of this glass. So we're losing heat out of here. That's my disturbance. If the temperature in this room is going to be decreased based on the surface area and the thermal properties of that glass. Temperature in this room is also going to be influenced by these vents. So this duct up here is touching the hot air, so that's a manipulated variable. Again, and that's going to increase temperature. The temperature in this room is also going to be affected by the windows at the disturbance. So in the summertime, that disturbance is going to add heat into this room. In the wintertime, the sign of what's coming through here, remember these are deviation variables, is going to be served to decrease the temperature. So disturbance is something that's going to try and push you away from where you'd like to be. You want to be at set points, but this disturbance is always going to push you away from where you'd like to be. The goal of the controller is to put in manipulated variable action into the process to keep you where you want to be. So we always have this dichotomy in a process. We want to try to push you away from targets. We want to try and do that by adding in manipulated variable. So our focus last week was thinking on how we add this manipulated variable. How do we calculate what is a suitable manipulation to apply to the process? We learned about the PID controller. The PID controller has fairly intuitive properties. And in the time domain, we can represent that as the manipulated variable is some controller gain, KC, times the error plus AC over TI, and then we integrated the error from time zero to our current point in time. So that was my integral mode. And then we learned about one other mode last week where we said KC times TD, and we took the derivative of the error with respect to time. So 
each of these three parameters are up to you to decide. And we call that act of you deciding what value of Kc you're going to use, what value of Ti you're going to use, and what value of Te you're going to use. We call that controller tuning. So you're tuning or adjusting the controller. Controller tuning's goal is to select values of those three parameters. <coughs> and yes, last week we spent pretty much Monday on the proportional, Wednesday on the integral, and Friday on the derivative mode. So we had a thorough understanding of what each value, sorry, each mode is contributing to the controller. So when we make a change to KC, TI, or TE, we know and we can expect what's going to be the impact of that change. Control engineers do not go to a distillation column and say, well, let me just try out this value of KC. Let me just try out this value of TI because you can easily make a mistake. You'll see in simulate when you start to just trial and error guess values, you're going to make a process unstable. You're going to cause it to go to temperatures and pressures that you wouldn't normally do in practice. So your boss is not going to allow you to just sit in the process and try out different values of KC and TI. You have to be able to have a very good idea of what any change to KCT INT is going to do before you go ahead and simply input it. Um, should that be DT star then on the input? No. Yeah. Right. Now while that equation is up there, let me just make one quick modification to it. One small modification we make is we recognize that dE by dt, that's referring to the time-based derivative of this signal over there, dE by dt can be undefined. dE by dt can be equal to infinity or negative infinity when you're making the second change. So when changing in a step-like manner. So if you make the set point change, suddenly SP goes in the staircase sort of manner. This error signal is going to show that same, same, same signal, and so the E by DT is undefined. We don't like that. We can't work with that. That's telling my manipulated variable to then head up to infinity. Or if it was the step down, you're telling our middle to get down to minus infinity. The implication of that is you're telling your valve to go fully open, fully shut, for whichever position it currently is at. That's not a good thing to be doing to the process. You don't do that in our house. You don't open the valve fully open, fully shut. Um, you cause significant damage to the pipes. In a chemical process, that would be asking, for example, all the steam to suddenly flow into a distillation column. If you ram steam into a distillation column, you're going to blow the trays up. And so the E by DT going up to large values is not a desirable feature. So what we recognize is, well, let's take a look at E. E is defined as the set point minus the control variable. So the E by DT is the derivative of that signal over there. And let's take a look at this derivative. So this derivative is problematic at the point of the set point change. But before the set step and after the step, that's simply just a constant value. It's only problematic right at the single point in time where that step is made. So that derivative is only problematic at that point. So let's ignore that point in time. And SP would be constant then. So what we can write is that this is equal to minus dcb by dt at all times except for the step.
and then but nicely what we can go do is up here in this derivative the e by dt we simply go replace it with this new version minus dc e by dt so because this is only undefined at that single point at the step we can simply use this as a good approximation and replace it so what we're going to do then is take a look here I'm just going to erase this dt by dt and we're going to put in minus dcv by dt so this minus symbol comes up in here minus dcv by dt so that's how we will practically implement a PID controller the theoretical development that we looked at last week the practical recommended way of implementing PID Well, now we have our objective here in mind. Our objective is to find KC, TI, and TV. But we're not going to do it by trial and error, as I've explained. That's going to damage the process, cause harm to people and operators and ourselves if we go trial and error values of KC, TI, and TV. Certain times it's quite okay. If I was tuning the controller for the temperature in this room, we find it okay to make a few mistakes. But in practice, on a chemical plant, we don't have that much. And the equipment is worth millions, so it's not worth the, worth the risk. So if our goal is to find values of KC, TI, and TV, well, we're going to have to have some requirements in mind for what we would like to see. And we started looking at it at Friday's class. So requirements for a great control system. And in our brainstorm on Friday, we said that there was three aspects that we would like to see. One is small error. First aspect was small error. And I put up two integrals on the board that will help our understanding of quantifying the error. So any control system should exhibit small error. One way we can ensure that or calculate it is to calculate what we call the integral absolute error, or IAE. And that was defined as the integral over the horizon which we're working with. And we're going to use the absolute value of the set point minus the control variable, which is simply the error. So in other words, we're going to take the absolute value of the error and then integrate that with respect to time, which is where the name comes from. Then there's the integral squared error. This one you'll also see very commonly, ISE. And that's defined in a similar manner over the time horizon from zero to infinity. And what we'll do is we'll calculate the set point minus the control <coughs> variable, square that signal first, and then integrate it. Okay, so, you should understand what this looks like just visually for those of you that prefer to look at it that way rather than analytically. What this means is if we say we're making a set point change to, a, to my process. So there's my process going along in time. And I'm going to make a set point change okay, So that's what set point looks like as a function of time. So the operator decides to raise the temperature in the process or increase some value that they're controlling and what might happen is we'll see our control variable moving along here and doing that settling out to the set point so in green then is my control variable what we're saying then with these integral terms these IAE and ISE well let's calculate the error 
trajectory over time. So what does L look like? Take a minute and draw it in your book. What would the error trajectory versus time look like? absolute error takes that signal, this E of t, takes the absolute value of it, and then calculates the area under that curve. So in blue then, the, I, the error signal would be, we take the absolute value, value so we're going up, then we do this, and we bounce. So it simply bounces above the line because we're taking the absolute value, and then the I, A, E, be this area. So integral absolute error equals the blue area. Yes. How can the line in the beginning is straight and not like going up and down? Oh, okay, yeah, a little bit of noise. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, my diagrams now will start to introduce noise just to get you comfortable with this. In reality, we never measure signals that are pure and clean. And so this is what reality looks like. ISE then simply takes that same principle a step further and recognizes that the error needs to be penalized even greater. So the square <coughs> over here, what the square serves to do is it penalizes larger error even greater still. So whatever this error <coughs> curve looks like, we emphasize it. So this will then come down like this. Okay. So ISE then equals the area under the red. So that's two ways that we can quantify the error. We can very easily go calculate what the areas are once we have the the values, you can put them into MATLAB and calculate the area using the trapezoidal rule and some of the other integration rules you learned about in 3D. Um, there's two others though that are, are useful to consider. Two other metrics. So here we've got IAE, let's call that A. ISE we can call B. Let's take a look at C and D quick. C would be the settling time. So this is the time taken to achieve 5% of the final value. context of this curve over here, this diagram, the green curve is my control variable. Once it's within about 5% of the desired final value, so somewhere around here, we can calculate a 5% limit. The moment that green curve enters into that zone, it's about 5%. What we're saying, this is the time taken. So the time from when we make the set point change to when we achieve that <coughs> settling time.
And it should be clear that a good controller will be able to have rapid second times. So our aim is we aim for short second times. This is like if you're turning on the thermostat in your house after you come back from a long weekend, you might have turned it down. Now you're turning the thermostat back up again to a, a comfortable temperature. This is the time it's going to take to reach about 5% of the desired value that you've asked for. And clearly, systems that can achieve that rapidly are more desirable. Then lastly, another term that we will consider is the maximum deviation. <coughs> And this is a, a quantity we want to minimize. So you want to minimize the maximum deviation. Okay. So we want minimal deviations of the control variable. One major criteria is small error, and we considered four ways in which we can quantify that. Let's take a look at a second way, is we would like our error to actually get to zero. So a major goal is <coughs> zero offset. That is a really important requirement, is that we achieve zero offset. What that implies is that the error as time goes to infinity must be equal to zero. <coughs> and that's easy to check with the final value. So that's one important point. Easy to check with the final value theorem. And secondly, and this is really important, the main reason why we added the integral part of the PID controller was to achieve zero offset. So go back to that lecture if you're not sure what I, why, we, why that is, but we proved it there. The integral mode in a PID controller is what guarantees us this, this zero offset. So it's the I in PID that gets a zero offset. If you take away the integral part of a PID controller, you're not going to achieve this goal. <coughs> Except there's one exception where that occurs. But in general, integral mode in a PID controller achieves zero offset. output, the error, and in part one and two, the third requirement is, well, if we're getting zero error, we're going to have to pay something to get that. Or if we're going to achieve our goal really quickly with short setting times, it's going to cost us something. None of this benefit comes for free. And one way we can quantify it, that is what, what is the manipulated variable doing? So if we've looked at our process, here's my process. We have to put in some manipulated variable to get that controlled variable. We cannot achieve a controlled variable that's close to set points at all times without a penalty. And the penalty comes at what is the manipulated variable? Okay, so one way we want to judge our controller, the third major point is the manipulated variable behavior. So let's, uh, let's put up some diagrams again here. This is one that we're going to see regularly with time. 
if I make the set point change over here, so that's my set point is the step I'm making in red, and is my control variable. My control variable is going to follow that set point <coughs> and perhaps change it a bit and then achieve set point. So in white I have the set point in red, I have my manipulated variable, I'm sorry, my control variable. So if the control variable is doing that, my manipulated variable is also doing something. In order to move the control variable, that manipulated variable is having some trajectory over time. How can we quantify the manipulated variable? Well, let's take a look here. If we could consider this to occur at time t0, perhaps my manipulated variable was over there until time t0. And in order to move the controlled variable in red by that, my manipulated variable perhaps did something fairly similar and then settled down. So this is my input into the process, follows a trajectory that's often quite similar to the control variable. That makes sense, right? For a process that has a positive gain, whatever you put in in the manipulated variable, you're going to see sometime later in the controlled variable just adjusted slightly. Maybe stretched out a little bit, there might be a bit of time delay, but in general we'll often see this sort of shape. So one way we can, we can um, consider this manipulated variable is to look at what we call our overshoot. So that's this amount. I'm just going to run out of space, so I'm just going to raise this quite above. So that's my manipulated variable. The overshoot then is defined as where we're going to settle out to divided by that peak. So this distance C is called my overshoot. And this distance D, which is where I started from to where I ended up with, that distance D is called the deviation. So let's just quickly recap what this is. It says that we're operating at some point in time, and this is my output, my control variable, and my manipulated variable is currently at some value here initially. Then at time t0, a set point change is made to the process. The control variable in red eventually reaches that set point, and in order to reach that set point, my green curve, the manipulated variable, also has to move. So the deviation is this distance by which it has to move, where it started from to where it ended off. The overshoot is by how much it exceeded the final end, end goal. So in other words, we've really put in too much energy, too much action into this manipulated grip. We've overshot where we, where we need to be. One way you can see this is, we could have probably achieved the same goal quite effectively if we had put in a manipulated variable that looks something like that. Right? So instead of overshooting on my goal, I've gone too far and then I've had to come undo it and then go back and reach my target, I could have probably done taken a little bit more smoother action. Okay, so one requirement when we analyze the manipulated variable behavior is we want to minimize divided by E. So we want to minimize our overshoot divided by the total deviation. And it should be clear that the smallest value you can get for that is 1. C over D, the smallest value you can get is more than 1. If it's greater than 1, you've overshot and you're putting more energy into the process. 
Okay, so those are three ways we can quantify our behavior. Now let's take a look at how we can achieve controller tuning that has aspects of the screw behavior. So this is where the page that you have in front of you comes in. <coughs> start out by saying and recognizing that these three goals are not achievable exclusively. If you achieve really large, um, if you achieve really good and low error, so zero offset and low error, you're going to overshoot and manipulate here. You can't achieve goal one and goal three simultaneously. There's certainly trade-offs between all the goals. So, we take note of the trade between the goals. Are required. And then the next point to make clear is that KC. TI and TV interact. What I mean by that is if you increase one, it's going to affect the other. If you increase TI and your integral error drops off, KC is also going to interact with that. There's multiple ways of sending KC and TI to achieve the same goal would be another way of looking at that. So multiple settings of KC, TI, and TB are possible. Tough problem to solve is to find what KC, TI, and T values to choose. And what this handout is in front of you is a study that was done by Dr. Marlin to find settings that work well in most <coughs> situations. And that's our initial way we're going to consider tuning a controller. and cone tuning rules and what they do is they achieve these goals well for the most processes. So let's take a look though that in order to, to do that, to achieve those goals well for most processes, they have to make some assumptions. And the one assumption that they make that's important to understand is that GP of S is equal to a gain e to the minus theta S divided by tau S plus one. And this we call the first order plus time delay system. plus time delay system. Now, a first order plus time delay system, just recall what that's doing, is it says that if I make a change to my input, so G is equal to my input over an output, if I make a change, I'm going to see a time delay initially of theta minutes, or theta seconds, there's a gain of k and there's a time constant tau. So 
just a quick recap then of some basics or to get to emphasize what that is. my process. So this step occurs at time t0. So the step into the input into my process, the output, if I look at this in time, is going to be at some nominal value initially, also up to time t0. And then we're going to see some initial delay by theta units, and then a first order rise to steady state. So this time that is spent over here, we call theta, is my time delay. I put my step input at T0, I'll only see an output delayed by theta units of time. There's some time constant then that tells me how I rise up to achieve that final output. So tau then tells you how quickly you ramp up here to achieve the final goal. Okay, so it's very, it seems like a fair oversimplification. But this first order plus time delay process actually represents many real systems in practice. I don't know why is it and B over C That's my mistake. Sorry, thanks. Good catch. Control variable. Or output over input. Okay, so that's what I'm choosing my controller for. I'm making that assumption that my process behaves in this first order plus dead time. And we're going to see next week and maybe later this week that this is actually a really good assumption for very many practical systems. If you're not sure what order a transfer function is or how a process behaves, first order plus dead time is a really good approximation. So that's why they've gone ahead and done all that work for, for this type of system. Let's take a look at how to use the tables that you find. And we'll look at that through an example. Consider the example then where the process my process model GP of S is given by this gain of five dead time of three units and I'm going to consider a time constant of nine units of time I S minus one. Okay, so K is five, theta is three, tau is nine. So take a look at the handout that you have. at the bottom of this figure tells you exactly how to use the, use the graphs. The three left-hand curves are used when you're tuning for disturbances. So the three left-hand side graphs are when you're tuning for disturbances. Rejection. And the three right-hand side graphs 
are for when you're tuning for set point changes. We'll go a little bit into that uh, on Wednesday's class about that distinction between disturbance rejection and set point changes. But let's work through this example first and let's consider the case of the set point change. <coughs> so I'm going to ask you to take uh, two, three minutes and try to use the graph that you have in front of you to calculate the controller tuning. See if you can figure out how to use the, use the curves and then we'll look at it together. So take a look and see if you can figure out the con controller tuning or set point changes for this process we're considering. Thank 
Okay, so any suggestions for KCTITE? Point three six four. Any values for KC suggestions? One over five, so point two. Point three. Some people have values of point two. Point three. Yes, agreement, disagreement. Yeah, most people agree. Uh, values for TI. Thank you. 